All right. Can you all see the the document? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So as I just said, so I just wanted to um, show you how to do the um, comparison of two correlation coefficients in R. Right. So um, whenever you think you may want to do that, um, so you have to actually um, also run the statistical test. And just a, so that's a warning, right? So think carefully um, so whether it is meaningful to comparison, right? So um, for example, so one could argue about uh, so the meaningfulness of comparing the correlation coefficients for, I don't know, yeah, in some anxiety and exam performance and uh, rated height, for example. I mean, that statistically it's possible, but it's meaningful, it's another question, right? And another problem is that, uh, so the correlation coefficients might not be directly comparable because we might have um, certain limitations and restriction of range, et cetera, that are different for, for um, both coefficients. So um, there, there are a lot of problems um, that can be associated with it. So always be careful, right? So the easiest um, case is the ideal, ideal scenario that you can encounter whenever you want to uh, compare correlation coefficients. So basically you want to test whether there is a difference between them is zero, right? So whether they're the same or whether they are different. Um, so the easiest case is that all the assumptions for um, so testing the significance, for, for example, Pearson correlation coefficients have been met. So you have the linear relationship you have um, and that is more important here, um, so the bivariate normality uh, for, your, for your data. And in this case, you can simply use the uh, co-core package in R. And so that package has a function to say name. And um, so, and that gives you the opportunity to test all sorts of um, right? different uh, scenarios that we will talk about in a, in a second. There's one thing that's a little bit annoying about CoCore. Um, so it is, it does not accept tibbles. So for, at least for me, it, it wouldn't ever complain. So I wouldn't want to run uh, so the analysis. It actually accepted only data frame. So it, it did not allow me to convert it into a tibble. Uh, so very strange. So normally I've never encountered that problem before. Uh, maybe it is just my machine. So you can test it for yourself, but for me it didn't work. So um, just as a side note. Okay, so, um, but it's also not a big deal, right? So you can write your own functions, it's actually not hard. So you, you simply use a formula, so that also on the, on the slides. So I think for, for two cases, um, I provide as a formula, or you can look them up on the, on the internet or in any textbook, so they, they're easily available. Right, so, and, and again, we are talking about um, comparing Pearson correlation coefficients and so the standard method for, for this comparison is um, based on the on Fisher's R to Z transformation. And that comes with all the assumptions that uh, so are associated with this transformation, right? And it's especially the normality assumption. So if that is violated, so we cannot use that method. And we will talk about it in a second, um, what, what the alternatives are. Okay. So um, if you have two correlations that you actually want to compare, then uh, so the first basic differentiation that you have to make is, are these correlations from dependent samples or from independent samples? So, um, and that is, you can interpret that in the same way that you would always interpret, right? Dependent and independent samples. Um, to give an example, so if I was interested in the um, correlation, well, stick with our example, but we, Exam, uh, anxiety and exam performance. Uh, so for students at Hunter were the students at Queens College, right? So then I have two independent samples. So the Hunter uh, students, the Queens College students. And so I have two correlation coefficients, right? So for each of these two samples, and then I can compare them as a pr proper method for independent samples. However, it's also possible that you might have um, a situation where you have um, so different correlation coefficients for this basically the same sample or dependent sample. That means, um, so um, yeah, you have um, your Queens, so let's say you're now focusing only on our Queens College sample 
And in addition to exam anxiety, we also um, collected this uh, third variable study time or revision time, right? So, and we wanted to know whether um, there's a correlation between um, exam anxiety and exam performance is different from uh, so there's a correlation between study time and exam performance in your sample. So um, that would be um, a dependent sample, right? So the correlation coefficients come from the same sample of um, uh, participants. And so they are overlapping, right? So um, what does it mean overlapping? So that means that, uh, so they involve one common variable. In this case, that is um, our exam performance, right? So we have um, on the one hand, so one correlation coefficient is exam anxiety, exam performance. And the other one is between, in, so study time, revision time, exam performance. So both basically contains exam performance, but they're called overlapping correlation. It's also uh, possible that these correlations for dependent samples are non-overlapping. So let's assume you wanted to compare something like, um, and then again, so you always have to ask yourself the question is that meaningful or not. So you could, um, you could, for example, um, have uh, two. So let's let's say you have in in it. An intervention, right? So you um, you did some training with your with your students, right? And then you have a pre post measure, right? So of um, so you they, they went through some yeah so just arbitrary idea, right? So they went through some intervention, and so that is supposed to. Um, Maybe improve actually maybe it is even to improve their uh, so their their study strategies right so how efficiently their their so sort of time management or so right so do some time and management intervention with them and then you have of course forget about whether it's useful so it's meaningful to do it that way or not so then you have a correlation between um, so exam performance and uh, exam anxiety before your intervention right so the pre um, correlation. And then you have the post correlation, right? So you have the same group of participants. So um, the, you basically, um, right? So you measure their exam anxiety and their um, some performance and some subject before you do the intervention, and then after you do the intervention. So then you would have four different variables. They collected from the same sample, and they, but they are not non overlapping. Right, because you, these are two different exams and they are two different anxiety scores. So, because you cannot be sure that the anxiety before the intervention is the same as after the intervention. That doesn't make sense. Maybe not an ideal example, but I was thinking about one that is perhaps a little bit meaningful. You could also say, well, is the um, correlation between exam, anxiety, and performance uh, the same as a correlation between? Um, so no, you could you could say is the so exam prefers uh, uh, exam anxiety and exam performance the same as between um, study time and uh, see so you now <laughs> I don't, I can't come up as a good idea study time um, and um, ranking freshman sophomore juniors and seniors sorry what was that study time and oh, okay and ranking like freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. Cause then by the time you're like a junior and senior, you know the techniques to like study in, at a college level. I mean, hmm. so you like develop better uh, studying yeah. tips because in high school, I, I know for a fact I studied differently in high school than what I did in college. That's so right. like my study tips got better, yeah. That, that is correct, but so um, that would be, uh, maybe I misunderstand, but that would be an ordinal variable. So I'm- mm, Okay, so, yeah. mean, so it can't be used for this type of correlation. Okay. Yeah, so let's, I mean, just it's completely idiotic. So the, the, the correlation between um, study time and so some um, achievement tests that measures the skill in this particular subject, right? But it's not exam mm -hmm. performance. It's just okay. some, other, some alternative measure, right? So it, again, so it's not very meaningful. Sorry for not coming up with a better um, example. Yes. So my pre-post thing was probably the, 
is a better approach to it. I hope I did not completely confuse you. So my point is we have to differentiate between the case that the um, software dependent samples, whether we have overlapping correlations that share one variable in so both pairs, right? So, or whether they are non-overlapping, right? Which could be, um, so you could also do something like, um, so if you have two different subjects, right? So you have the study time and the exam performance in for, I don't know, Psych 101 and then uh, development of psychology, right? And you test the same subject would pro probably be better than <laughs> I just babbled about it. Okay, yeah. So then you have two different study times. So one for, for both um, topics and there are also two exams, right? So but all the same group of students who are taking both. Okay, so, um, alrighty, so as I said before, so we have to differentiate and so um, we are here we're using our exam um, data set again. Uh, so where we have right so the study time or the revision time, the exam performance and the anxiety on gender. Uh, so and we know that the certain assumptions have been violated, but for right now for this first example, we'll just ignore that, right, so, uh, so we will ignore this the assumptions and we will just I will demonstrate right using this data set how we perform the, the analysis. All right, so uh, so let's start with the independent samples. And what we are going to do here is we will compare whether um, revision time and exam uh, performance differs between male and female participants. Right? So that means we have two independent samples, males versus females. And so we have, right, so we have our study time um, variable and exam performance variable for both of them. Okay. And then, uh, so what you need to know is that um, also CoCore expects your data um, to be in, in a list, right? And this list objects, we haven't talked about lists yet, I wanted to, um, I didn't want to overwhelm you with, uh, with, with too many um, data structures or I wanted to get used more to the data frame before we are talking about more objects, right? So right now, uh, so all you need to know is, is a list is more like a higher order um, structure and the list can hold multiple data frames. So basically what, what, um, so what uh, Cookcore expects is that you have um, a, a list that holds a data frame for the two different groups. So in this case, it wants a list that has, um, so as a first element, a data frame for, for like say females, and as the uh, second um, element has a data frame for males. And so um, I'll just show you how to basically, how, can, how you can create such a list. And then it's, it's not a big deal, right? So we will talk about uh, um, so the list, data, so list data structures and other data structures we have matrices um, in our data semester, data this semester. Okay. So um, and in order um, to, as I said, so to com combine or convert our our data frame um, into a list, so we are first using the split function. So that comes with the R base package. So we um, basically, right, so we, we, we first um, have to pull out, so our variable gender, because that's the one that we wanna use as a split has to be based on gender, right? So that's why we are taking that out because that is the first argument. Um, and then we are um, passing that to the split function uh, in combination with our original data set, right? So it's our original data frame. And that is, if you do that, so then this is what happens, right? So it, it now prints you, um, so your, your list. And as you can say, so as you can see, it has um, as a first element, as a female, right? So it takes your, it basically takes your category. So the, the potential values that you have in, in the variable gender, which is female and male. It takes them and um, creates basically um, these, so two different, two separate data frames for each of these um, values, these potential categories. And so this is just as you can think about it as, right? So like a, a data frame of data frames, you see that here with the um, dollar operator as usual, you can uh, access the first element. Well, this is the first element in your list. It's your female element. 
And this is just the same structure that you have in your in your data frame. So the only difference is that now you have only females here, right? And then, so the second element in this list is male. It's your data frame for males, right? And so again, you can see nothing has changed except for the fact that now all, all males are visited in a separate data frame. So, and that's that's the way that um, Cocor wants your data to be structured for um, comparing the correlations. All right, so um, so another um, so slightly annoying feature is that um, so if you cannot give it um, integers. No, it also won't accept integers. No tables, <laughs> so no integers, no. Um, yeah, so only lists um, as, as input, so it's, it's a bit um, uh, restricted. So, um, and our, in, our, in our data, so in our data frame, uh, so actually exam performance and um, revision time um, happens, to be in, happens to be integers. So we have to convert that to um, a numeric format, so doubles first, right? And that's what we're doing here. So we are basically assigning the uh, second and third column. So it's revision time, exam performance. Um, so we are, um, so right, we are we're assigning new values to these two columns. And these new values are simply the original values. And we um, apply a function that is called S double to those, to all um, elements of these two uh, columns and S double just makes takes whatever you give it as um, as input and makes a double out of it if it can right so in case of an in if you give it an integer as input so it's not a hard thing to do for for R so it converts it into a double right so to a different um, data type and that's where what we are doing here we're using the command L apply. And see, L apply is doing nothing but to apply this function here to all elements in these two variables here and these two columns from the data frame that we are giving as argument here. Okay. So here you have to specify um, so the, the data that you want to apply a certain function to. So this is in this case, right? It's a revision time and exam performance. So these are the two columns of our or data frame, and then we use the function L apply to um, apply that to each element in these two um, columns. Okay, so we are making everything to um, a double. All right, so um, and then we so we finally have our data in the format that um, it's supposed to be right. So, um, and now, um, so CoCor has some rules how um, you basically tell it what, what you want to compare. And if you have, if you want to compare correlation coefficients that are based on independent groups, so then your formula can look, um, so basically you can take on three different forms and they are shown here, right? It could be, as so it always starts with a tilde, and then it could be A plus B, this um, vertical, so it's like an OR, but it's it actually, it's not an, an OR here, it's just it's like a separator placeholder. And then again, A plus B. So that means, uh, so you're um, comparing the same um, variables, but in different, in different groups. It could be um, A, B, and A, C, or it could be A, B, and C, D. Yeah. And so these variables in the first correlation, that means um, so between A and B must refer to the columns in the data um, frame of the first element of, your, of our list. So in our case, it's the females, right? So the females data frame and the variables of the second correlation have to refer to those in the second word, so element of our list, right? In our case, it's the males data frame. All right, so you just have to make sure that your data is organized in the right way. So otherwise you um, may not get what you want to. All right, so we do that all over again. So we combine the, the above two, so the two functions above into one um, command, right? So we have here, so of course we have um, converted everything to doubles. Now we have to split, um, so 
split our, our data frame again. So to make it like two um, separate data frames um, for males and females and um, put that into a list. And so, right, so this is this part here, which is just making a list. So with a two elements, one data frame for females and one data frame for males. And then we can uh, so finally um, give that, right? So this list is input to cocore. So the function that actually tests the two or compares the two correlation coefficients. And so here, um, of course, we're using the formula um, that has this, this format here, right? Because our variables have the same names in both, in both um, data sets, right? So for both groups, um, revision time exam as uh, so a revise and exam so you might have other data sets where actually you want to compare something has so you want to compare variables that have different names um, and so it could be for example that you have a data frame where you call you, so the the variable for females is called is called like revise f right and exam f and revise m for males and exam m for males so it depends on how you you label that and how to organize your data. So, right, so it's, it starts with this tilde, so we have the two um, variables from our, that correspond to our females data frame, you know, the first element in our list, and these are the two variables um, for our uh, male data frame, the second element in our list, and that is simply, right, so this, this, this dot here is simply a placeholder for this entire um, so for the end product of this um, expression here, that is just a list as a two elements, so two data for informants and females. All right. So if we do that, um, so we get um, so some output, and uh, so right, it tells us um, what our first um, correlation is, right? So the revision time, exam uh, performance, and we see that it's 0.44, right? That's a good for our females. And then the second um, correlation coefficient, so again, the beam revision time and exam performance is 0.36 rough, so rounded for males. And it also tells us the difference between the two is 0 .8, uh, 0 0.081, yeah, roughly. So that is not much, um, and uh, probably not significant, so uh, probably not an, an unexpected event uh, if they were actually um, the same. If they came from a population with the same correlation coefficient. Um, so, and here, right, so it, it tells you what these indices are for the female. So, uh, J corresponds to revise, K to exam for the males, right? So, the H um, corresponds to revise and the N to exam. Again, so these could be, so in our case, they have the same names, they could have different names, right, and for different examples. It tells you what your sample sizes are. So we have 51 females, 52 males. And so then what your null hypothesis is, right? So that the first correlation is identical to the second correlation. And then of course, as an alternative hypothesis are not identical. So the alpha level is default to um, 0 0.05. You can change all of that. And so it tells you what is the z-score. Um, so based on the on Fisher's uh, so R2D transformations, it corresponds to value. Mm -hmm. And so not surprisingly, so we have a z-score of 0.5. Um, so that means a difference of 0.081 is actually a rather um, common outcome uh, for two samples that have the same correlation, right? So uh, it's a different score. That means if I, right, if I would say, Again, so that is always right under the ability of the um, under the assumptions and null hypothesis, right? If I draw samples of that size from two populations, so let's assume, right? So males and, and females so have um, the same true correlation, and I repeatedly draw samples of the same size. I, I, I calculate the correlations. I calculate the difference between the correlation coefficients. I plot the distribution of these different scores. So um, then I will get a distribution that is centered on, on zero, right? Um, and, uh, so, and so our result, right, is also relatively close to zero. So it's a very common outcome under this um, scenario, right? So it's just uh, about half a standard deviation above the mean. And so 
correspondingly, the p-value is high. Yeah, so we have in uh, 63, roughly 63% of the cases, we would have um, a difference uh, so that is less or equal than uh, 0.081. All right, so in this case, we would say, well, that is a very uh, plausible result um, if the two um, correlation coefficients were actually um, equal, so we will um, keep this, that null hypothesis. Yeah? So it's not, it does not um, provide us with, with enough evidence to consider an, a different hypothesis. So it's very plausible. Okay. So, um, and now, so after um, covering this, uh, so this, this case for independent samples, so let's move on to the dependent um, samples, right? The correlation coefficients, uh, so but from, from dependent samples. And now we ignore the gender um, variable, so we treat the entire sample as one um, uh, homogeneous uh, sample, right? And um, so we compare the correlation between revision time and exam performance and ask whether that's the same as the correlation between anxiety and exam performance. Right? So now we are comparing this revision time exam performance the same as anxiety exam performance. Now probably not, we already know from last week that as a revision, revision time and exam performance had a positive correlation and anxiety and exam performance had a relatively uh, large negative correlation. So um, it's so probably so <laughs> unlikely that they that they uh, that's a true um, difference as so they're the same. But let's see. And again, also our assumptions are violated, right? So, but we'll see what um, what the uh, test here tells us. So for um, dependent uh, samples, uh, so the, this basically your your um, two correlations must follow the pattern A plus B and A plus C. So where A, B, and C represent columns in your data frame. So now, of course, because you, you have one sample, right? Um, so it, so the, the function wants the, wants, it, wants the data in one data frame. So you do no longer, it does no longer expect it to have a list that holds two different data frames. It wants one data frame and once the three, in this case, right, the three variables that are um, part of the two correlation coefficients, so I want that as columns, right, in the same data frame. All right, so that means we can just work with our original exam.df data frame. And um, so we simply, so again, we call a core or function. So we um, give it um, the variables, so which are revision time and exam performance, right? So this is our first correlation. So these are variables that um, underlie our first correlation coefficient, and then revision time and excite. Oh, why did I do that? Ah, that doesn't matter. So I want actually I wanted to do exam performance and, and anxiety. Um, I did not do that here, but. It doesn't matter, right? So for, for the purpose here of, of just showing you how it works, it's the same, right? So in here, it's a correlation between um, revision time and anxiety. Let me just check whether I wrote something different here. Oh yeah, so here I said anxiety and exam performance, sorry about that. So I will change that, right? So, um, and upload the, uh, so the tutorial again, so, but, this is, we, we're showing that um, so to learn how we um, do it in, in R anyway, so that that's meaningful or not. Um, so it's a whole different question. Okay, so the output is very, very similar to what we've seen before. So, right, so just to reiterate, so we just would have to write here exam and anxiety instead of revising exam. Okay. So we get basically the same um, output Right, so for, um, so we, 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 right, so it just confirms, okay, revision um, time and exam uh, performance was your first variable pair, then revision time and anxiety was the second pair, right, so this is a positive correlation, it's a negative correlation. Um, so the difference is 1.106. Um, and uh, so we have, um, so or basically the, the indices here in these, um, in these 
in these for these coefficients uh, correspond to a revision time exam performance and anxiety. So group size now is 103, right? Because we do not no longer differentiate between males and females. And then of course, null hypothesis again, that the two correlation coefficients are equal. And then you get a whole bunch of, of different um, outputs here. And these are all different methods how you can compare these two um, overlapping correlations for dependent samples. Uh, so, and so this is a, um, basically based on uh, Fisher's R to Z transformation. And these are all sorts of, of different um, suggestions here. Uh, so I, it's not that I would recommend a particular one uh, here. So and in this case, um, it's also, I mean, they, they all come to the same conclusion. So right, there's um, they're just minimal, um, only minimal differences between them. So um, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter, and that is true probably uh, for for many cases. All right, yeah, and then um, so we also here at the end that is maybe the most um, trustworthy indicator. So the confidence interval um, so that is based on so what the zoo in two thousand seven suggested, and so if that confidence interval does not include zero, so that would basically um, indicate that uh, say you, that it's um, that they are unlikely to come from um, so population with the with same true correlation, right? So um, and if anything, then I would rely on on this measure here on this statistic, right? So if it if if you have contradictions between um, so these different um, so tests then um, I would check that and that would be my tiebreaker, right? So which one I, I would trust. Okay. But in, in this case, so they're all consistent and um, indicate that this it would be, it's a really rare event. So to have um, such a difference um, between the scores if they, if they were actually um, identical. So the correlation coefficients, right? So. Okay. Um, all right. And I mentioned already that um, CoCore works for Pearson's R only. And so at least as far as I know, there is no alternative um, package that would allow you to compare either Spearman's row or Kendall's tau. So whether they are, right? So whether they are the same or not. And um, so what you can use, what you can do is you can um, use, so if you want to do Spearman, you could use um, CoCore and um, just use it on ranks. And so I basically um, showed that here um, for demonstration purposes only. It's not, it's actually not a good approximation um, because the, the way I um, calculate the ranks is not ideal, right? So, um, and it's, it differs from um, the way it is normally done. So just to, to give you like a general idea of the principle, so that's not how you would do it in real life. Um, so, but, um, so, so theoretically, just want to, to demonstrate that what you could do is you could um, transform your data into ranks, right? So instead of the, um, of the raw data, and that is very easy. So here we, we are just creating a new um, data frame, right? So where we have instead of the original um, data for revision time, exam, ex uh, exam performance and anxiety. So these are the columns two to four, right? Um, we are um, using their ranks and there is a function in R that is called rank also comes as a base package, which is doing exactly that. So it's basically converting your data into ranks instead of your um, original values. Right, and then we're using the alloply function again to do that for all the columns here. Um, so that we are giving the function, right? So what it does, it is applies, so here alloply applies the function rank to these three columns here of our data frame, right? So that we have ranks instead of um, raw data. And then we can uh, simply use core core on the ranks. Well, that is the, the idea. Again, so here it's just a rough approximation to reality, 
because the, the, met, the method for rank determination is not, is not the way it's supposed to be, right? It's not, not perfect. All right. So, um, okay. But we come to the same conclusion as we came before. Uh, so what we what you can do is um, so if you have independent samples only so it's all like a little bit um, patchwork right so there's uh, so one package here one package there and so uh, for for different cases um, so there's uh, actually a, a package that's called WSR2 that provides a number of um, robust alternatives actually not only for correlation but also for uh, t-test and ANOVAs. So that means if, see, if you have problems with outliers or um, certain assumptions are not met uh, for, your, for your analysis, then um, you can use those method, methods instead. And they're actually also, in, in many cases, they're also um, based on bootstrapping. So which we will talk about in, in a second. Uh, so, and if you have, in the, basically, if you want to compare Here's some correlation coefficients for that from independent samples, right? So like in our first case where we were comparing the correlation coefficients for males versus females. And you have data that violate the um, assumptions for Fisher's uh, R to Z transformation. Then you can use um, so the WSR2 package. And so yeah, we, we, so here you have to input the data in the same way as for core tests. Sorry, that's supposed to be double R, double, so two Rs. Um, and so what we're using is a function that is called 2P core, <laughs> and it expects uh, four data vectors, so one for each column of the data frame or for each variable. And um, so that basically forms the two correlation coefficients, right? So say x1, uh, y1, x2, y2 for the two correlations, right? That means the, um, so two variables each. And um, so, right, in this case, if we wanted to compare the um, revision time and exam performance between females and males, right? So we would um, call this function to Two P core, not two core. What did I do? It's a, because two core is a different function. It's <laughs> sorry about that. So it has to be two P core. Um, a lot of typos here. I, I apologize. So two P core, right? And then you um, give it so the female um, revision time, female exam performance, male revision time, male exam performance, and uh, you de define um, what. Um, basically what the, the correlation function is supposed, supposed to be, and that is here called the, so they call it the percentage bend correlation. And so I would refer you to the paper that I posted on, um, so Blackboard that um, uses this, this robust um, measure as well, right? To, um, for, to, to estimate, um, so correlation that is not influenced by outliers or by assumption, by violations of the um, normality assumption. So, all right, um, as I said, so um, ignore the um, results here. Uh, so they, they are um, different because I was calling, um, so it's a wrong function here. So it, it's supposed to be two P four. All right. And that unfortunately works for independent samples only. So there is no equivalent method for, for dependent samples. So for, to compare correlation coefficient from dependent samples. All right, so. Um, and then, so let's uh, move on to the, um, to another option. And that would be my preferred option. So rather than um, looking for like, packages that might provide this functionality or the other, I would rather um, use either bootstrap or permutation tests if I wanted to um, compare two correlation coefficients if my um, assumptions for, for all the others are z-based or just, right? So everything that's based on the standard normal distribution or the t-test, the t-distribution, 
if that is not too possible. On the, so basically comparisons that are based on the p-distribution, if, if those assumptions are not met, then I would always basically go, go um, to, to either bootstrap or permutation tests. Okay, so today, uh, so last week we were talking about the bootstrap example and so this week I wanted to show you um, so the, the sister method, which is a permutation test. And so the underlying idea is similar and actually very um, intuitive. Uh, so the, the main difference between bootstrap and permutation testing is that for um, permutation testing, you're sampling without replacement. And it's basically uh, so as I said, so very intuitive and, and, and simple underlying idea. So let's let's say we wanted to test um, again whether the correlation between uh, study time or vision time and exam performance is different in, in, in males and versus females. Right? So whether, uh, let me rephrase that. We wanted to test whether it's the same. Of course, that's what we're basically, what we're always testing. We're always testing the null hypothesis. Right? So if you always test whether the data are plausible under the assumption of the null hypothesis. Okay, so, um, and if that is true, right? If, uh, say, if the, uh, if the correlation coefficients are identical for males and females, then it shouldn't matter whether a participant is male or female, right? It doesn't make sense. So if, they're, if the correlation coefficients are, if the correlation is the same, but so for, for these two um, uh, groups, so then it wouldn't matter whether a participant is, is male or female, right? So um, that means if we would simply shuffle the, the labels, so the, um, so the basically whether, um, a, so basically whether we would, if we would randomly assign uh, so our cases and our samples a label male or female, then um, we should come to the same conclusion, right? So if there was basically that, that wouldn't matter, right? So any difference between between the cro so basically if you right if you would randomly assign each each case um, so the label male or female, and then we would calculate the correlation within these groups of assigned females and assigned males. So then of course these correlation coefficients will probably also be different just by chance. But that is simply a random um, variation, right? Because there are, there are no true differences. So, and if we do that over and over again, right? So we are randomly assigning participants a label, either a male or female. And for each, each time we do that, we calculate the correlation coefficients for the you know, males for the females, and we calculate the correlation as a difference between the two correlation coefficients. Um, so then we get our sampling distribution for the null, basically under the assumption of the null hypothesis or our so-called null distribution. Yeah, so that would be basically just the random, random fluctuation of um, differences and correlation coefficients if, so there was actually no difference between, um, between males and females, between our two groups. All right, so that's what we do um, when, we, when we do permutation testing. As I said, it's the same as bootstrap, the same idea as bootstrap. The only difference is that we sample um, without, without replacement. All right, so. Okay, and we do that as I said. So we basically randomly, right? We say, okay, male, female, male, female, male, female. We do, we do that multiple, multiple um, times, right? So, like, the, like say 5,000 times, 10,000 times, right? And, and that, that way we create our own null distribution. We create our own sampling distribution because we don't know what it looks like, right? So our, our assumptions are violated. No idea what the sampling distribution looks like under these um, conditions. So um, we are using our existing sample to come up with an, uh, with an approximation of the sampling distribution because that's all the information that we have. And um, so that's what we are doing. All right. So, and here, uh, so in this code, we, so I'm um, just setting that to 5,000 permutations, right? So permutations are just, the permutation is just the random shuffling of the, um, of the assignments, basically. So the, whether um, a participant is assigned to the um, male group or the female group, right? So of course it has nothing to do with the actual gender. 
so they're just randomly assigned these labels. And this I'm permuting, right? So I'm, I'm shuffling the, the gender labels. So, okay. So we do that 5,000 times. So 5,000 times we shuffle, right? We are creating, we, we, we are basically, we are, we are ran, so we are, it's, it's like in an experiment, right? So you randomly assign your, your participants to like two conditions. Well, let's, so now we are randomly assigning them to either female or male, and we do that 5,000 times, right? So we are, we are we're just assigning these as labels, and then we calculate the correlations within the group of males and so assigned males and assigned females, right? Okay, so this is just um, an, a basically an empty vector that holds all the, basically has 5,000 elements. And it just holds our, um, the difference, the difference is between the correlation coefficients so females minus males, right? For each permutation. Okay, so this is uh, simply, uh, so it looks, <laughs> looks like a lot of code. And uh, just, just to get, uh, so the numbers, how many uh, females and how many males do I have in the sample, right? So just the number of cases, okay, it's males and females. And so here I um, we are sorting by genders. It's actually not necessary. So I just did that to make it like a little bit more. Um, so we don't have to do that just to make it. Uh, so first to show you um, how we how you can sort data if you need to do that, and second maybe to make it a little bit, a bit easier to think about for you. Okay, and now we are starting um, with the actual um, permutation, and so we're using a for loop. Right, so we are doing we do so this everything that's here in this for so called for loop, right, between these curly um, brackets here. So we do that for each yeah, individual. So we do that basically for each element in, in this vector here, the vector one, two, and perm, so one to five thousand. Right, so we basically just says we do that five thousand times, <laughs> nothing else. So do that 5,000 times, this stuff here that's um, inside these um, curly brackets here. And so after you're done with the first round, you count up two, right? So it basically is counting one. So when it's done, two, done, three, done, four, done, five. And when it has reached 5,000, then it stops and moves on here. Okay. So that is our, right? That is how we create our sampling distribution. So that is just the, the um, basically the, the permutation, right? I'm, um, I'm randomly sampling 51 indices. So from our 103 cases. So we have 103 um, participants total. And I'm just basically randomly, I'm randomly selecting uh, 51 participants that I assign to be female, right? But I assign the label female. And um, so, and this is just a, a, a list of these indices, so the row numbers, right, so that I randomly selected as uh, designated to be female. And now I um, uh, calculate the correlation between um, exam um, performance and, uh, sorry, between a revision time and exam performance uh, for, for these yeah, participants for the subset that I have assigned the label female. Again, doesn't matter what they are in real life. <laughs> I have assigned them the label female. Uh, and I use Kendall, right? Because in this case, I um, want to do that um, to compare uh, to, um, so Kendall's tau for, for these two groups. And so here, I'm simply removing all, um, basically all these um, cases, the assigned females and for the remaining um, uh, cases uh, which are my yeah, designated males I'm also um, calculating the correlation between um, well, Kendall correlates so Kendall's tau for um, revision time and exam performance right so revision time is a second column of exam performance the third column in our data frame all right and then I calculate the difference between female and male and um, put that in my vector that holds the results, right? So this vector is then uh, the one that is my sampling distribution, that basically holds my sampling distribution. Okay, cool. So we do that 5,000 times, right? So we fill each 5,000 slots in our, in our vector here. 
And then, um, so I'm simply computing the empirical, so the, the observed difference between the two correlation coefficients, so based on the, on the actual uh, gender. And, um, and then we are plotting that and basically we are just um, drawing a line where our um, empirical difference is. So this is our sampling distribution here, right? So these are the, um, this is our null distribution. So that's how, uh, it's our estimate of what the, the distribution of differences between the, between Kendall's taus for males and females would look like if uh, it wouldn't matter whether you're male or female. So that means if the correlation actually would be, would be the same in these two groups. And so here's where our um, observed differences, right? And you can already see that it's basically <laughs> the center of the distribution. So, um, and that, I mean, without doing any statistics, so mm, just looking at that so we can tell that, uh, so, right, it's a very plausible result. It's a very plausible difference for uh, the assumption that the uh, correlation coefficients actually do not differ. So, uh, under the null hypothesis, it's a plausible finding, right, it's a frequent finding. So, all right, that is our empirical difference, right, it's 0 0.05 roughly. Um, so here I um, calculate the p-value that corresponds right, to this um, observed difference here. And it's, um, so in this case here, it's 72.16. So yeah, so um, of course, <laughs> that does not urge us to um, reject the null hypothesis. And um, so, and basically, uh, so it's also consistent with what we what we have found uh, here, right? So for for business correlation, okay. Um, so that is the same thing here. Just instead of um, calculating Kendall's tau, we are calculating Pearson's R. So that is just to show you how how to do it. For, and, and then you can all do it for Spearman if you, if you want to. The only thing that you change is um, is the methods how how you calculate the correlation. Goal. Uh, okay, same conclusion here. All right, so, um, okay. And so the last thing I wanted to talk about is the point by serial and by serial correlation. So um, just as a reminder, that will be very quick. Just as a reminder, right? So point by serial correlation is simply the Pearson correlation between um, a, a continuous, so a numeric variable and um, binary variable. So it has only two values, right? So one and zero or one and two, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so, and um, as such, we can, we can simply um, calculate the bicerial correlation uh, using our um, regular core test function. So the only thing that we have to make sure is that we um, transform our binary variable into a numeric format. That's all we need to do, right? That's what I'm doing here. So I'm, I'm just to because our gender was like right, male, female. So it was, it was a character. Um, so I had type was character type. So I need, I need numeric uh, values here. So that's why we have to convert that into a number. Um, so that's what I, what I do here, right? So that makes it ones and twos. And um, so then we can simply calculate our, our correlation that being um, yeah, so let's say anxiety and gender, right? So gender being our binary variable or dichotomous variable and um, anxiety, of course, a continuous variable. So, and what we can see here is um, so that the um, correlation is um, close to zero, <laughs> basically. Uh, actually, so, so close to zero that it's rounded to zero. So that means um, that that's a, um, meet that females and males do not actually differ in their anxiety scores, right? It's um, sort of an equivalent to a t-test. All right, so, um, and what we can do now is, um, so, right, so that would be like a regular point by serial correlation. So, um, but we can also um, calculate the bicerial correlation coefficients. And what, what was the bicerial, was the idea behind the bicerial correlation coefficient? So the idea was that I have a continuous variable and a binary variable, a dichotomous variable, but the binary um, variable is actually an artificial dichotomy. So that means there's an underlying um, continuous spectrum in the, in the features, a characteristic that I measure. 
in this row block. So it means either, um, so I had, so either I, I did that in my, my analysis, right? So that I, I actually measured it on a continuous scale and then I did some arbitrary um, cutoff so that, for example, all participants under a certain age are considered yeah, young <laughs> and above a certain age are considered old. Um, so, or I do something um, where I measure something only as one or zero, where you can assume some content underlying continuum like aptitude, or, right? So, um, so I don't know professional skills, right? So then you have like a um, just very, very rough measurement. Okay, and then what the bicerial correlation is doing, it is estimating. So basically, it's estimating the true um, Pearson correlation between two continuous variables. So it, it's basically a trying to, um, to um, undo the fact that the second variable has been dichotomized. So um, it, it's, it's basically trying to, to um, yeah, just right to approximate the, the correlation coefficient that we would have obtained if we would have measured that second variable on a, on a continuous scale. Oh. So, and what we're, what we're going to do first is we will actually um, dichotomize um, one of our variables. So that is the exam scores. So we will make that a binary variable and it's just arbitrary. So we can, for example, assign a so zero to all subjects that have a, sc a score that is lower than 40 and a one to all other subjects, right? So, and so we are creating a new um, variable here, right? So um, where we are, so this, this variable is called exam bin, so a new column in our data frame. And so this is um, for basically if our um, exam score is uh, lower than 40, then it will be assigned um, value zero, so it was the case. And if it's, um, right, and otherwise, if it's not uh, less than 40, it will be assigned a one. And so in the first step, we are just um, calculating the correlations for um, revision time exam uh, performance and this binary exam performance. And so I'm just doing that to show you two things. So the first thing is that our correlation between uh, so the binary variable and the original um, uh, variable is not one. So, um, and the reason for that is that we are losing information, right? So we are losing information about the the variability, so the true um, variability of the scores when we are just assigning it to two categories, right? Rather than having all these nuances um, between the, the different, so for different scores for, for all the participants. And if you think about it, it's also, it makes intuitively sense. If you think about it from a regression point of view, so then um, despite the fact that um, you can perfectly predict the, um, so the binary score, so or you might be able, right? If you have a perfect relationship, so you might be able to perfectly predict the, the binary score, because that's one or zero from the original exam score. But if you were trying to um, um, predict the, the, uh, the original score, right? Or the continuous scale from the binary variable. So that's impossible, right? So that's impossible because you can only we have only two predicted values, one for, for cases that have a, a one and one for cases that have a zero. So you always have residuals, right? You, no, a perfect prediction is not possible. So that's why the correlation coefficient cannot be one here. All right, so that was so uh, one thing I wanted to, to show you. And then the other thing that is closely related, so the same reason is that your um, correlation between revision time, exam, performance, original scores is higher then um, so there's a correlation between the revision time and your binary score. All right, so, um, and so what we're, so basically in order to now um, estimate, so what to undo basically this, this dichotomy. So, um, and, and normally, right, so we don't have the original data. So normally when we're calculating the bicerial correlation, so we're trying to estimate a correlation for data that we do not have. So here we have the data, of course, right? In, in real life, when, we, when we're calculating by zero correlation coefficients, we don't have those, those original, those are true continuous data. So this is just to, to demonstrate um, well, that how we might end up with something like that. 
So um, what we what we can can do is we are um, so we are using the function um, holy serial from the polycore package, and um, so and we are in order to estimate the true here's some correlation between uh, so the two continuous variables, right? So and you can see that it's estimated as 0.36. So that means we are coming closer to the um, original um, correlation that we observed here, right? So it's, it's um, considerably larger than the 0.26 for the binary variable. The reason that we're not, not, not so one of the reasons why we are not uh, actually um, able to, to replicate the 0.4 is that our um, revision time and our exam scores as well are not Perfectly. So basically, they deviate. Not the exam scores, not, but the revision time deviates from from um, from normality a little bit. So that is um, one problem. And then, of course, if you always right, there is no such thing as um, perfect prediction of something that you have not observed. Okay. So this was was just to um, demonstrate. So how you can calculate a serial correlation, right? And in what cases it might be meaningful. All right, so um, that was what I wanted to add to the correlation um, topic. And um, do you have any question about that? Or also, if not, then we can talk about the exam. I know that um, some of you had questions about that. All right, so um, then, uh, so regarding the, um, the format of the exam tomorrow, so I, I think I mentioned that before, but so just to reiterate that another time, so it will be a mix between um, my sort of essay question or short answer questions, and um, so multiple choice. Uh, so multiple choice won't be many, so it'll be around 10, so 10, so something between 10 and 12 multiple choice. Um, questions and um, so the other part will be probably five questions. Um, although it is probably won't tell you too much um, because um, I mean a question could re still <laughs> require a lot of so one question could actually take you more time to answer than, than ten <laughs> if I would answer the the question in the right or wrong way. Uh, ask the question in in one way or the other, but I think it will be about five um, short answer questions and um, so roughly like 10 to 12 uh, multiple choice. I'm not going to present really which ones to include and which not. And then everything including correlation. So everything in the lectures that we have talked about, um, but not um, regression, right? So Correlation also, yes, but not regression. And um, so you don't need to do right code. You don't have to do analysis in R, but you have to be able to interpret um, output from R, right? So that is, it's not super R specific. It's based on the, the tests and the stuff that we have talked about in class. But there might be some, as I said, so some basic might ask you, so please interpret the element, elements of this output. So in total, that's 15, right? 15 questions? Roughly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to like get, but it's on, it's on. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm like, my brain. Okay, it's okay. I I'm like thinking of all the stuff that I read over, and it's not seven uh, PowerPoints. It's technically five, so I understand. And and five five short answers. I'm gonna assume it's gonna be like on each um, subject like one subject on one question on like skills and management and like another short answer on correlation 
Okay. I, I understand why you why you said that equally. Okay, I get it. I get it. I'm sorry. Perhaps I'm like, I make no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I could ask you five questions about um, the scales of measurement. <laughs> okay. No, it's not. There's no. I mean, it, right? So, um, I mean, I try. Of course, I try to cover um, everything, but um, it's not that. There has to be so one from each, or that I say, well, we will definitely not. Uh, there won't be a question about that. So, um. yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Yeah, um, there's no true and false questions in in the multiple choice section. There is what? Is there? Are you gonna put in any like true and false questions or no? True and false. No. Okay. Yeah. There will, be okay. At least, there will always be at least four options to choose from. Okay. All right. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. So in the multiple choices also, I mean, that is, it's an open book, right? So that means um, it's not like a, a, like a standard multiple choice. I, I, I know my facts thing. So it's a little bit more, right? So for some, you might have to apply a little bit more right, so than just looking it up. <laughs> and so another thing is, um, so that I actually wanted to ask you, so the way I have to check on, on Blackboard um, whether I can set, I think what I can do is I can make it available within a lot bigger, larger time frame. So I could make it available, for example, between five and midnight tomorrow but so once you have started you will have only two minutes so and then it will automatically submit <laughs> so um it will be so we will have uh so it will be posted on blackboard board under i'm not sure what the rubric is but i will send another email tomorrow either assessment or exam i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure a test um so and then um i think that's the way that's what I did in the past is that I can make it available for like a longer time range to, I just want to accommodate, accommodate those of you who might not be available, available tomorrow from five to seven so that you can take it later. Appreciate that. Huh? huh? I appreciate that because of my situation with uh, Dr. P Pitta's class. Yeah, right. So. Um, I, I just have to uh, let me double check that I will, I will I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I did that in the past um, and then but the, the thing is once you have started you have only um, two hours to complete your exam right so it's not that you have like six hours seven So and I think it will automatically submit for you once the time is um, over. Um, I, had a question. Yeah. I had a question about the assignment. Mm -hmm. For assignment four, um, we have to figure out the z-scores and said we just have to find out the standard their standard errors and divide by that, mm -hmm. right? But we're having trouble like finding the standard error formula I looked it up and there's like a couple. Yeah, you can use um, you can use uh, what I mentioned earlier when um, Matt asked. So you can use the uh, stat desk function from Pestex. So that gives you the standard errors. Okay. Wait, it does. I thought you. I thought it didn't. It gives you the standard errors. It does not give you the z score. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. <laughs> got, I got it. I got it now, I think. <laughs> but also I noticed I think it gives two, sta two standard errors for the uh, skewing kurtosis. So is that correct? Uh, sorry, it was what? It gives two standard errors for the skewing kurtosis, like standard error times two. So it, it also, it spits out that was, uh, you can just, yeah. So it gives you basically this, this other, the two SE, um, output from stat desk is basically just make it easier for you. So it's easier to, to read. So you basically don't have to do any calculations to determine whether you have a significant deviation or not. But it's not exactly what I'm asking for. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Okay. Any other questions? Or... Um, I have a question regarding um, testing independence mm -hmm. in the correlation chapter. I'm I'm kind of confused um, how to apply the the chi square test. Um, so what, sorry, yeah, are you talking about the um, categorical variables or so that? Um, yeah, like under the tables. So we did not, so basically I, be, I decided not to, basically it's, it's still in the slides, but we did not talk about it in class and I decided that we will not cover it now. So because I wanted to use the available time to actually talk more about um, so the uh, regression for um, numerical um, variables and also about um, sorry, correlation for numerical variables and a regression. And then the, um, so the more, so the, the, gen, the linear model in general. And I said so that perhaps if we have time at the end of the semester, we will get back to that, but it will not be part of the exam. So oh, okay. All right. Worry about the you don't have to worry about the um, correlation or, or dependence uh, testing and dependence among. Okay, and great. Uh, All right. So I don't know if you already mentioned this in the beginning of class. I was a few minutes late, but can you just remind me up to where we ended then for that lecture? Like what's going to be in the midterm? Yeah, and there's everything. So that's basically uh, that we covered until, so it's basically until point um, by serial and by serial correlation. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. So the rest was just FYI, at least for now. All right, so then if you um, don't have any further questions, so then I would have a question. So for the, uh, so this whole concept of bootstrapping and permutation, would you like to have a little bit more practice for that? So first, is that something that um, you, so that it makes sense or is it something that re remains unclear to you? And so yes or no, and, and, and independent of that first question, what do you like, because that's important. <laughs> do you feel you would benefit from more practice? Yeah, I think I get the concept, the theory behind bootstrapping and permutation, mm -hmm. but I feel like I might be able, it might be helpful to have a little more practice with it. Yeah, I and, was gonna and, say the same thing. I. I want to practice more on it because it, it can be a little tedious. <laughs> so I just want to be, reach a point where I could do it comfortably. So I, I want to second that. Okay. All right. So that's good to know. I mean, we will continue um, uh, including um, examples, but it's also getting a bit more complex. So as we moving on to more complex tests, but yeah, so I mean, uh, I'll see, maybe I can um, so here and there do a few more ex so examples for easier questions because it's, it's something that you need a lot and that's getting more and more common. All right. Good. And there's no type of calculation, like simple calculation of like probability, none of that. This is just strictly conceptual for the midterm, right? Um, you mean whether you have to do any calculation by hand or perhaps? Yeah. So you don't, have, okay. perhaps, I mean, you're not, you don't, you do not have to use R. But then you have to do something. Yeah. Like, perhaps. Okay. I mean, All right. It's not a, it's not right. A, yeah, I, I was just I was just curious because R kind of takes a, a little bit of time, but if it's like a hand calculation, that's fair. Okay. Yeah. All right. Probably not, but um,
I had actually I had one question that that required that, but I took it out. <laughs> so, but I'm, perhaps I include another one. <laughs> yeah, it won't be. I mean, it won't be heavily, right? I'm not taking. I'm not testing your basic arithmetic skills. I, I want to know that you understood the the concept. So. So yeah, it won't. There won't be like a heavy calculation component. We don't. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Anything else? And so then, yeah. If if that's that's all. So um, again, I will. Um, I will let you know so um, whether whether that's true what I just said so regarding the conditions of the exam so how long it will be available and where you can find it and um, so and then just it as a general um, advice so uh, use the spring break maybe to um, to to revise a little bit so or, or to to review uh, so what we what we have talked about and get a little bit of a head start also on the assignments. Um, I will I will post assignment six um, so this week as well. So and um, I mean we will talk about so some of the tasks and and on assignment six so we will talk about next week so not next week so week after spring break. Um, but you can definitely get started on that. Um, you mean assignment five? Yeah, if I'm assignment Wait. five anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> you started scaring me. I'm like, wait, assignment four is the tomorrow. Did I miss something? <laughs> yeah. no, okay, no, no, all right, okay thank you. The reason why I'm saying that is because after spring break, there will be one, I mean, I'm, I make them shorter than they used to be. I make them a little bit, so a little bit more manageable. Um, but there will be one assignment for like three weeks in a row. So there will be one assignment due every week. So I think it's six, seven, eight. So they are all due okay. over like six, six, seven. So they're all due basically in three consecutive weeks. So, and I just want to make sure that you don't have like any rights so that you don't sit on mm -hmm. assignment five <laughs> for, for like all okay. time. But assignment five is due after spring break that that Tuesday, right? Or is it due during spring? Okay, all right, just making sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. All righty. Yeah. Then, um, as usual, so you can always ask questions or anything else. So I I think the uh, the exam should be should be doable. So time wise and difficulty wise. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, then I'm um, still yeah. huh? kind of nervous about it though. I don't know, Dr. Ong about it. I will admit that. <laughs> I was saying I'm still kind of nervous about it. Exam's gonna be anxious. Listen. <laughs> exam like like that data that we got on exam and anxiety listen <laughs> but it's okay it's it's all right it's two hours okay yeah. okay and then uh so also i mean as i said so and i, I said that uh, several times oh do you um grade on on the curves that's what i i just wanted to address that i'm not planning to but so yes and no <laughs> So I'm not not planning to to grade on on, on the curve, um, but if uh, so, uh, have a, it turns out to be that's the best score or like seventy five percent, then I will. Yeah. So if basically the exam turns out to be harder than I initially thought, then um, I will adjust basically, right? So that so the whatever is the highest score will be uh, one hundred percent, and then uh, so that we get like a more appropriate um, distribution. Okay, alrighty. 
So yeah, and if you have other um, questions or concerns or, or general like things that you would like to to change, right? So things that maybe we um, that you would like to approach in a different way or discuss in more depth or so, let me know. Um, so I can modify. So Spring Break will also give me a chance to modify as a um, as a structure a little bit moving forward. Yeah. So. If you have any suggestions for improvement, let me know. All right. Okay, so if, if any one of you, I mean, I would say <laughs> we, we just um, um, finished for, we, we're basically probably done for today. If you want to talk to me, um, so maybe just send me an email um, quickly if you want to meet with me one on one during um, so my office hour today. Just send me a quick email and then I give you like a time frame, time window where we can then we can talk. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so then um, good luck for tomorrow. I mean you will hear from me anyway beforehand. And uh, thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.